Todd, and you can you can start there. Uh, well, all right. So I'll uh, just start off by saying uh, thanks to everyone um, in the room. It's and uh, I guess on Facebook Live globally here we, um, that's joining us this afternoon. Uh, it is uh, an honor for me to be able to be a part of this. Um, it's actually, like I said earlier, it's kind of cool to uh, be able to share with people, you know, globally um, in real time these days because, you know, 20 years ago this wasn't real possible. So um, I will uh, try to pace myself. Uh, I will warn everyone listening, uh, and Gustavo knows this from uh, our meetings in person, uh, that southern accent gets a little strong sometimes and I, I tend to move a little quick. Um, so if you have any questions, just feel free to uh, interrupt, and we will uh, move on from there. Uh, all right. <clears throat> all right. So today, I, I just wanted to take a little bit of time. Um, I'm going to make sure we're. I'm going to try to keep it to around uh, around 30 minutes or so. So about uh, let's see, 4:45 your time, 2:45 mine. Uh, we'll uh, hopefully wrap up and leave plenty of time for questions. Um, a lot of what we're going to talk about. Um, it's going to kind of be design oriented. Um, it, don't worry for those of you that uh, were in attendance or, or maybe joined the live stream of Trek last week uh, in San Diego. Uh, it won't be quite uh, designed at that low level um, as some of those were. But I'll try to try to leave you with some some things to t keep in mind while doing uh, work in warehouse type environments, um, and then give you kind of some survival tips uh, at the end. Um, kind of some key important notes to uh, to always remember. Um, so again, Surviving Warehouse Wireless, my name is Scott Lester, uh, CWNE 253. Uh, I am a Senior Systems Engineer for Layer 3 Communications uh, located just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I am a subject matter expert for Layer 3 and I tend to specialize in uh, everything uh, that's weird when it comes to Wi-Fi. Um, I do a lot of warehouses. Um, my previous work was uh, with Maru Networks. Uh, that was actually uh, acquired by Fortinet just a couple of years ago, if you uh, recall. Uh, with those guys, I, I was in some pretty unique and challenging environments. I did a lot of warehouses for those guys as well um, with a little company uh, many of you may have not heard of. It's called Amazon.com. Um, also done a lot of uh, Major League Baseball stadiums across the United States. Uh, I've done some Lufthansa cruise ships out of uh, the Canary Islands. Uh, as well as spent some time uh, in Australia and various locales as part of a, a global uh, field support team for those guys. Uh, by far, though, I'll say my, my greatest experience was I had a one-week cruise that I was supporting um, out of uh, Bayonne down to the Bahamas. Uh, you know, it's it's quite pleasant when you get to work on board a cruise ship and, and your work is really just kind of babysitting the wireless in, in case it goes down. Um, so we'll kind of move on. Uh, next slide, if you would. Uh, Try to make it a little fun for you guys. Uh, obviously, I would pronounce that, um, but as, <laughs> as Gustavo can tell you, uh, I tried to pronounce one word in San Diego, and uh, it went so poorly that I was like, you know what? Surely I can't mess this up if I just put the text on the screen. Uh, so I'll try to have a little fun with you guys. Um, obviously, um, you can read that, and I can't, but I know what it says. So uh, anyway, we can move on to the next slide. Can you say that word again? Let's see what you can understand. Anjanyo? Say that oh, again. Anjanyo? I was trying to say little angel is the word that I learned years ago, and apparently uh, when I was small that... Anjanyo. Anjanyo. <laughs> see, I'm, 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 I'm going to do my best to speak English, and I'll leave the, uh, the interpretation to, to you all. <laughs> Um, so if you, uh, social media, just a quick blurb, uh, website, uh, if you don't know me, it's blog.theitrebel.com. Uh, you can get me on Twitter as well, at theitrebel. I know several of you already follow me, uh, but I'm always looking for more people to, uh, to converse with online. Uh, and then if you're in Slack, um, I try to stick to the screen name, the IT Rebel if it's not taken. Um, if many of you, I'm sure, probably heard of the, the Wi-Fi Pro Slack uh, if you haven't, uh, Gustavo and the guys can can definitely tell you who to uh, contact to be a part of that um, and just kind of make our global community just a little bit smaller. Uh, next slide. I feel so important, like I'm telling someone what to do, what changing my slides. It's kind of a <laughs> unique thing for me. Uh, quick bio slide. Um, 
CWE. Uh, I also have an ACDX with Aruba. Um, I've got multiple vendor certifications with the little badge on the rider, just a few of them. Uh, been in information technology for the last uh, 14 years. I started about two years before I graduated um, college. Uh, I, I, just a quick blurb on that. Um, when you find something you enjoy, and many of you are obviously already into your professional careers and have found wireless, which is a very good topic to enjoy, um, when you find something you enjoy, stick with it. Uh, I decided that I was going to not do computer-related things because uh, I enjoyed them more as a hobby than as a career. Um, and about uh, two and a half years into my college studies, uh, I found out that organic chemistry is not where I wanted to be. <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, uh, the IT job came to the rescue. Um, so I spent the last eight years um, working uh, strictly around wireless. Um, obviously, work as a wireless SME now for the company I, I work for. We do. Uh, we are an ABC shop. Uh, for those of you that don't know what ABC stands for, it means anything but Cisco. Um, and we we do that um, not out of any um, you know pride or anything towards one vendor. It's just uh, the guys that started Layer Three a number of years ago happened to work for a little company called Bay Networks, and many of you may have heard of over the years. Um, they've kind of been gobbled up by Nortel and, and Avaya and all such since then. Um, and the guys just chose to, uh, they didn't want to be a part of the big company, so they, they didn't want to sell anybody that kind of reminded them of where they worked. Um, not to say that Cisco doesn't make great products. I know several of you work uh, with Cisco, maybe solely with Cisco, even have some uh, Cisco employees. Um, but, uh, you know, when it comes to wireless, that's the great thing about wireless is, you know, really and truly regardless of a vendor name on the access point um, and, you know, the code behind it, at the end of the day, wireless is wireless regardless of who makes it. Um, so it's a good thing to have uh, kind of a standard around us that we can all rally around. Uh, if we can move on, please. All right, so for those of you that may have been paying attention to the background slides, um, and if you want to go back to slide one and kind of move quickly back to this slide, um, you'll notice that the background image as you kind of move through the slides starts becoming a little clearer as you move along. Um, I kind of well. did, yeah, it's a, it's a very, uh, I did that on purpose. I like to kind of start off uh, presentations with something interesting, make you kind of keep on your toes that you're paying attention to the slides themselves, um, especially when I can't be there in person with you guys. Um, but you'll notice that we've kind of brought the warehouse into focus, if you will, uh, over the last few slides. Uh, we're starting to get a clearer and clearer picture of what a warehouse environment looks like and what type of scenarios that we're going to be looking at covering today. Um, and hopefully at the end of the presentation, you'll see uh, the light at the end of the tunnel and your picture of a warehouse environment and how to cover it uh, with good success will become more clear as well. So we'll move on kind of into our next point. Uh, so when we talk about warehouses, I kind of want to point out uh, three, um, three concerns, if you will, when we start looking at warehouse coverage. Um, so if you'll, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, you'll see kind of our concern number one. Uh, we're going to talk about coverage. And, and obviously, you know, this is the big one in the room, but this is also the one that everyone thinks is the easiest one to, to complete uh, when doing a warehouse design. Um, the issue that I've seen over the years is that while coverage may be the easiest to complete uh, by just simply getting the signal out everywhere into the warehouse, it's also the one that people seem to have the most amount of difficulty doing properly. Uh, there's a lot of things, as you can see in the first bullet here, um, when it comes to coverage, is we have to be very understanding of what the warehouse physical appearance is. Um, many people, you know, are going to go in and they're going to take a two-dimensional drawing, if you will, load it into something like an IB wave or an Echohal site survey, or even a, uh, for those of you poor souls that are still using air magnet. Um, uh, maybe loaded into air magnet, and you're going to complete your traditional predictive survey of the space. You're right. You're going to go in. You're going to give it a scale so it knows how large the space is. You're going to pick your access point that you've chosen to use for any particular project um, or your antenna combination, you know, if you're using externals. Uh, and then you're going to simply start moving around the map, placing them on the map. Um, how many of you in the room have uh, taken the ECSC, the ECAHEL Certified Engineer course, by any chance? Anybody? Okay. Uh, we need to get uh, Keith and those guys down in that neck of the woods, Gustavo. Um, 
So when we're doing a predictive design, right, the if you're using the traditional Ekahau color scale, the color that we want predominant throughout the map at the end of the day is green, right? Green is good, if you will. Um, but, you know, as we kind of joke around, for any of you that kind of keep up with, uh, you know, Marvel and, and DC Comics here in the States, uh, you know, the, the Hulk is not always the best tool for the job. Sometimes you need precision work. Um, sometimes we don't want to just cover a map in green. There's some unique things and characteristics between access points that we need to pay attention to. Um, one thing that that traditional two-dimensional survey, if you will, of a warehouse space for your predictive survey does not take into account is the height of the racks themselves, what the attenuation is of those racks, um, and then furthermore, they don't take into account what the capacity of those racks are or what the contents of those racks are. So if we'll kind of move to the next slide while we're talking through this thing. So on the next slide, you'll see a couple of different pictures um, of a warehouse environment uh, that I was recently in. Um, on the left, you'll see uh, some traditional warehouse racks, as we'll call them, shelving units, uh, whatever that parlance may be in your area of the world, um, loaded down with uh, many, many boxes. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, we'll see kind of the end of the aisles, with, as you see the numbers running down the sides of the aisle, um, as well as a manufacturing type um, or assembly portion of the warehouse. So many people, when we think of a warehouse, we think of just a simple building that's used for storage. Um, however, as many of you are probably aware, over time, warehouses have kind of come to be not only a place that we store things uh, for later use or for shipping or whatever, um, but they've become a place where we're doing product assembly or final packaging as well. Um, so we're going to have these multiple use cases within a singular building where in one portion of the building, we're going to be storing things. Uh, we're going to have forklifts running around. We're going to have people pulling items off of the shelves to put them into a particular uh, location or to put them on a truck for delivery. Um, and then in another portion of the, of the same facility, we may have these large open areas, as you see in the right-hand image um, on the right side, where we have workbenches set up. Um, in this instance, these workbenches, as you'll notice, the cardboard, uh, if you can kind of see that, uh, there's a bunch of cardboard boxing on a table there. Um, this is where they're actually going to pull the small items, put them into a, a single box, and package those up and put those on the truck as well. Um, so this is kind of a, a, a great image to look at because in, the, in this singular slide, we see multiple use cases for a warehouse that we have to be able to, as wireless engineers, design around and make sure that the coverage is there throughout the facility and that the performance is what we need it to be. So as we look at the image on the right, um, how many of you can tell with a good degree of accuracy how high those racks are in that image? Anybody want to guess? 20 feet? 25 feet? 25 feet. Meters are okay. Um, I can kind of do the conversion in the fly on my head if you want to go meet. <laughs> um, uh, eight to nine meters. Eight to nine meters? Okay. You're, you're, you're pretty close, Gustavo. I'm impressed. Uh, so those actual racks measure about 27 feet to the top shelf, um, and then you've got about another two feet of product above that. Um, anybody want to guess? Gustavo, you've already guessed, so you don't get a turn this time how high those lights are down the center of that aisle on the left image. Like, what meters? We, we have the same feet, or meters is okay for you? Uh, <laughs> either. I'll make Gustavo translate it. <laughs> uh, 36 feet. 36. Wow, who gave you my slides ahead of time? That's actually <laughs> that's, that's pretty impressive. I, I I will admit now, um, I am absolutely horrible at, at estimating distances. Um, if not for my trusty laser pointer, which is usually within a couple feet of me on any particular job, um, I, I I don't even venture into that space. Um, so the the ceiling height in this case is right at about 33 feet. So 36, you're about a meter off. You're pretty pretty accurate on that. Um, I wish I could do that myself, um, <clears throat> but. So we were talking about building that predictive image, and we were talking about how, when you build that image out, uh, we can only take into account certain characteristics, right? We can only take into account the information that we put in. And one thing that you'll hear many engineers say when they build a predictive design is the predictive design is only as good as the information you have to put into the design. Um, a predictive design, and I'll just kind of state this as, as a matter-of-fact statement, 
Um, a predictive design should never be completed without first physically visiting the location and putting eyes on the warehouse environment or any environment that you're going to actually be working in. Um, in, in case in point here, you know, we can tell based off of the floor plans that we were provided to do this job with that there are several racks throughout the space. Um, if we get the CAD drawings, we can get a little bit better accuracy in knowing how far apart um, east to west these shelving units are. Um, but one thing that we can't take into account based on that CAD drawing typically, um, if it's of the profile of the building, is the height of the racks and the height of the ceiling um, in, the, in that space around the racks. And the reason that the, those two heights are very important is that without those, we don't know where we can mount access points at. So as we move kind of into the next slide, if you will, um, our, our second part of our first concern, I know that's a little confusing, uh, is mounting options. Uh, we always need to be able to look at the environment, physically inspect that environment, and find those unique cases um, and, and fill in the gaps of information that we have about the building um, that otherwise we might not be able to get. Um, I say that, um, that you as the engineer, if you are the one doing the predictive design, I prefer personally for me to be the one that goes out and does that um, on-site visit. Um, however, if you have a, a team of folks and someone that you trust that can gather those measurements accurately, um, by all means, send those guys, especially if it's a, a remote location in particular, um, because we want at the end of the day to gather as much information about the space as we have to build a, a more accurate predictive drawing. Um, and then we'll kind of talk about how we rectify those things later on in the, in the presentation. Um, the second part of being on site is not only do we need to know what the rack heights and the ceiling heights and things of that are, but we need to know where are potential areas that we could mount access points. Uh, in the case of this particular warehouse, if we kind of want to move to the next slide and I'll kind of continue on, um, you'll see uh, a couple of different uh, profile pictures. So on the right uh, is the present coverage in that warehouse facility. Uh, so we have uh, an access point utilizing, uh, you know, external dipole antennas um, mounted on uh, directly to that ceiling, the lowest part of that beam there, uh, that as we said earlier was about 33 feet, uh, roughly, I'm going to do rough measurements, so I'm going to try this, roughly 11 meters. Um, I, I kind of do the one to three thing there. Um, so it's roughly about 11 meters high. Um, now the issue, with, does anybody kind of already see an issue with this image as we look at the image on the left of this particular warehouse and then we look at the picture on the right showing how the access points mounted? You may have picked up on it while I was kind of giving you the measurements earlier. Anybody want to venture a guess? There would be no case. There's any problem. So the issue that we ran into in this particular facility is that with the minimal clearance above the racks to the ceiling height, utilizing an omnidirectional antenna pattern as such that comes from this particular access point, we were not able to get signal into the aisles more than one aisle away from the access point. Um, the aisles themselves are about uh, roughly a little over three meters, I believe, uh, apart. Uh, and what we found is that the access point, if it was placed immediately above you, um, where you were standing in an aisle, you had pretty good coverage throughout that particular aisleway. But if we moved one aisle to the left or one aisle to the right, we started getting a very sharp attenuation, a very sharp drop off of signal out of that access point. Now, the case in point that we ran into, the problem we ran into in this particular warehouse is, this warehouse is roughly about 280,000 square feet. Um, I'm not going to try to do the, the, the metric conversion <laughs> on that, <laughs> um, but we'll, we'll roughly say um, uh, around 90,000 square meters. Is that close enough, Gustavo? Okay, roughly around 90,000 square meters, which um, is a very good sized warehouse. This particular facility with access points mounted as you see them in the image on the right, there were only 12 access points that served the entire facility because like many warehouses, this facility was done several years ago 
Uh, there was no predictive design done. It simply started out as a, well, we need coverage in this location. And then as the warehouse expanded and more technology was added, we needed coverage over here in this location, over here in this location. And we just kind of added APs all around until we felt like we had very good coverage for what we needed. The second part of that issue comes to the fact that this particular access point is a dual band access point. We have both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Well, the initial devices, much like kind of as wireless grew over the years, the initial devices were 2.4 only. And from the 2.4 perspective, we had very good coverage. However, the latest round of device refreshes, we started getting a lot of reports of issues. We're not getting good connectivity in the warehouse. We're having issues kind of here. Our forklifts are dropping connections. Well, what we discovered in our site visit was that the devices were actually 5 gig, or they were preferring 5 gig in this instance, uh, which created a little bit of a problem for us. So kind of, kind of talking about uh, uh, mounting styles, if you will, if we'll kind of move to the next slide, uh, we'll call the image on the right our, our, our overhead omni coverage. Um, so this is just simply uh, an access point uh, with omnidirectional antennas. They can be external dipoles in this case. It could be an external patch antenna. Uh, that was uh, providing an omnidirectional, uh, well, I shouldn't say patch antenna, I should say um, providing a, an antenna providing an omnidirectional pattern, um, or it could be integrated antennas with a bit of down tilt in them. Um, now, what we find, and kind of as we talked about it just then, uh, we have poor penetration of signal with the overhead omnis in this particular instance. Uh, you know, as if you're a participant in the wireless community, you know that you'll hear a lot of, uh, of us talk about uh, different scenarios. We'll kind of give you different ideas of how you cover things and all like that. But at the end of the day, the phrase, it depends, truly is what matters in this case. Um, I can tell you that in this particular facility, this particular coverage plan, a deployment style, was not valid for the space that we needed to cover. Um, it was years ago, but as more inventory and more shelving units were brought into the warehouse, the environment grew, thus the coverage plan needed to change. However, like many institutions, the wireless was already up, they thought it was good enough, so we didn't need to expand any. Uh, now, the good part of that is, is that it provides a fast deployment, right? You can cover a lot of ground very quickly in it. But as you'll see, our second point on our cons or our negative side is it has a large coverage area. And then you, you're probably looking at the slide thinking, well, wait a minute now. You have large coverage area as a con and as a pro. All right, so this is what I mean by that. The pro is that we have a large coverage area, so we can cover a much larger space with fewer access points. The con of that is, is that while we can cover a larger space, we can't prevent adjacent and co-channel interference from an access point with omnidirectional coverage even at that height. So while we won't see a lot of interference down at, at one to two meters off the floor where our forklifts or our employees are going to be utilizing their laptops at, when we look at this same environment from 11 meters up, you're going to see a lot of co-channel and a lot of adjacent channel interference potentially depending on power levels in the environment. So as we'll kind of move to the next slide, we'll look at the space that we just saw uh, from a warehouse perspective. So on the right-hand side of this image, you'll see uh, the large uh, assembly area, if you will, uh, where the packaging and all that, that was going on uh, as we saw a few, few images back. You can see that we have a couple of APs represented with the green dots, maybe a little hard to see for you guys. Um, but uh, the large green area on the right side of the image was a, a fairly open space covered by those omnidirectional antennas that were shown in the previous slide. Uh, but then as we move to the left side of that image, you'll see immediately what I was talking about with we have good signal penetration, you know, down the same aisle, if you will, as the access points mounted on. But as you start moving horizontally left or right through the space between aisles, we quickly degrade and quickly lose that signal. So this particular image, the drop-off point for gray on the image is neg 70. Uh, many of you are saying, whoa, NEG-70, that seems really low to, to you know, kind of design your warehouse for. But we also have to think about what warehouses are used for, the data and all that's transmitted in that warehouse, and we'll kind of touch on that here in a little bit. So if we move to the next image, uh, you know, we talked about gathering as much data as you possibly could. So this is an image of the warehouse um, with a predictive design that I did. Uh, you can kind of see uh, the AP numbers in the gray dots. 
um, move uh, throughout the facility. So what I did during my initial design of this space is I took a blank map, laid in my measurements of the space as far as uh, length and width of the building space, and then placed pre uh, predictively placed AP placements throughout the building. Had very good green coverage, everything was perfect, this will work no problems whatsoever, until we went on site and we saw that we only had about four feet of clearance between the top of the rack and the access point itself. So that clearance above the rack, even though we had an omnidirectional antenna pattern, that clearance was so low that we were losing a lot of signal. We were blocking and reflecting a lot of the signal as we went into those adjacent aisles. Furthermore, when we actually started walking through the space, we found out that the reason we were losing so much signal is not because necessarily the amount of clearance between the top of the aisle uh, and the top of the inventory in the aisle and the AP itself, but it was the inventory itself. So this particular manufacturing or warehouse facility for the manufacturer uh, stored a lot of uh, metal parts, a lot of uh, fluorescent light fixtures and things of that nature, very metal heavy, a lot of copper wiring and things inside those metal fixtures for fluorescent ballasts and things of that nature. And then on top of all of that, there was all of the cardboard, right, that was wrapping all those objects up in the shelves. So when we talked a little bit about our initial concern, we need to get into that space. We need to look at not only the, the measurements of the building, but we need to know what is in the racks, right? What is in those racks largely helps determine how quickly that signal attenuates and how much of that signal can spread throughout the environment. So you can see once I went back in and drew the dotted boxes in, which are representing our aisles, uh, they're represented at uh, 27 feet tall and a loss of uh, three, uh, 3 dB per meter. Uh, which was representative of what we actually measured in the environment, you can see how patchy that coverage got really quickly throughout the facility itself. So we knew immediately that the omnidirectional antenna coverage wasn't going to work for us in this case. So we sat, I took a step back and I said, okay, well, what can we do differently? All right, so one other particular style that we can talk about as we move to the next slide is the end of aisle coverage. So what do I mean by end of aisle? So you can see on the right hand side here, we took a uh, what many people call a co-location mount. Uh, it's a mount, as you can see, the AP is mounted there in the body of the, of the mount itself and then to the left side of that bracket, um, you can't really tell in this picture, but that's actually going to be an external patch antenna uh, with a certain uh, beam width coverage that we're shooting down the aisle. Uh, that all, assembly is all mounted and aimed particularly uh, with some uh, just a, a simple electrical box hanging off of a rod as you see down uh, from the ceiling itself. Uh, these used to be my preferred way to cover a warehouse. We got good signal down the middle of each aisle and we were able to minimize our adjacent co-channel interference because rather than lining these things up down the same aisle way uh, or the same walkway as you see in that image, we would alternate. So in this aisle, we would put one at one end and then on the next aisle over, we would put one at the other end coming back toward us. So a lot of you are thinking, well, wait a minute now, you know, we really don't wanna shoot two access points against each other. Uh, but we were able to do that successfully in this warehouse because of the inventory and the heights of the inventory and the amount of inventory that we had, the amount of attenuation that we saw from the signal from aisle to aisle, we were able to do this very successfully and that we were limiting the amount of, of spillover, if you will, from one AP into the next aisle over. Uh, so as we kind of looked at, at building warehouses this way, you know, the con of this particular um, deployment style, if we call it end of aisle, are potential obstructions. Now, what do I mean by potential obstructions? Uh, potential, potential obstructions in many warehouses are going to be your forklifts, right? Uh, the last thing that you want is a forklift driving at, uh, you know, let's say 15 kilometers per hour uh, down an aisle way because those things can move pretty quickly. Um, and clipping the access point or what happens when it turns when that forklift turns into that aisle raises up to pull something off of the shelf in front of the access point right then you're blocking coverage down the opposite end of the aisle so that your users that may be at that end suddenly have little to no signal to do with but then that that forklift drops down moves on suddenly coverage is back leaves the network administrator if you're uh, you know someone like myself sitting there trying to figure out what's going on it leaves you scratching your head it doesn't make any sense uh, it took me actually two days watching a warehouse environment to figure out what was happening after we uh, we deployed this. 
Um, now, the pro of this or the positive of this type of deployment is you have better line of sight, right? We, we always want line of sight if we can in a wireless deployment because as we have line of sight, that typically increases our odds of having a higher signal-to-noise ratio, a higher SNR that's going to give our users a better experience, right? Typically, if we have a high SNR, we have a good experience. A low SNR is a bad experience. Um, but we are also able, by doing this end of aisle approach, as I said, kind of earlier touched on, we, we increase the signal attenuation aisle to aisle, kind of limiting some of those negative effects of having so many access points in a particular warehouse. So as we move on to our next slide, we'll kind of kind of can take I, a, can I make a sure. question. Yes. So in this type of deployment, uh, you end up having to dedicate an AP or, or two APs Per corridor, right? Per aisle, as, as you're saying. Just and one. Just, just one. So we do one. We do one on. So let's say we have aisles one, two, and three. So on aisle one, we'll put one access point at the southern part. On aisle two, we'll put one at the northern part. Aisle three, go back to the southern. So it's kind of a zigzag pattern as we move throughout the space. Okay. And then, uh, since you're having to dedicate an AP to the, the aisle, have you evaluated the the possibility to have uh, an AP uh, with omni antenna installed in the middle of the of the aisle in a medium height, not not in the floor, not in the mm -hmm. ceiling, but mm -hmm. in a medium height? Is mm -hmm. it an issue of uh, is it a RF issue doing this, or is it more related to uh, being not a protocol installation for a warehouse mm -hmm. where you have forklifts? So and you're people. you're talking about putting uh, an omnidirectional antenna maybe middle way of the aisle yeah. down down lower than the top of the aisle. That's right. Okay, definitely an option. Um, something that I've thought about. Um, you can see it, it's really hard to get an idea of the image that you see in the on the right hand side of the screen now. Um, those access points are mounted just above aisle height. Um, there is a, a a sprinkler, a fire fire sprinkler pipe that runs almost directly in front of it that kind of gave yeah. us some coverage. Um, the one issue that I have with putting things um, below the top of the rack height in a warehouse is kind of you touched on is your forklifts. Um, uh -huh. These things, these things, regardless of what you put on them, you could paint them bright neon yellow or pink or put somebody waving on them, you know, a flashing sign. These things are forklift magnets. They absolutely love to find the nearest forklift and make friends with it. And I can tell you, in in no you know no case have I ever seen the access point win. <laughs> so, yeah. um, okay. so I, I always try to keep try to keep things out of uh, a potential obstruction um, or a hazard, if you will, for either a person or a forklift. Um, it'll it'll help you and I both. <laughs> yeah, and, and when you do this kind of analysis. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you assuming also that there is people that could be working in different heights, like uh, not mm -hmm. only a forklift, but a, a worker scanning things or picking things uh, up, I don't know, yeah. 15, 20 feet up? Or no? Yeah, definitely. So uh, in the case of the image you see there, I believe that was a, a 60 by 60 degree beam width antenna. Um, so we had a pretty wide berth on the signal, both horizontal and vertical. Um, which was uh, plenty of space. Um, you'll kind of see the down tilt a little bit on there. Um, that's going to give us, uh, essentially, it's going to put our coverage ending just at the foot, um, at the bottom part of the nearest rack to us. Um, and then we try to keep it at such an angle that we still have good height um, so that we can clear about midway of the of the shelves. Now, uh, it, it, it depends, again, on the environment that you're working in. Um, in the particular case of uh, the facility that this image was taken with on the screen now, this facility used uh, uh, forklifts with barcode scanners. Uh, however, unlike some of the barcode scanners I've seen where they'll actually put the emitter, the, the IR emitter, um, on um, the, the forks of the lift itself, so as they raise up and down, it shoots it at fork height. Uh, this particular one, um, since these are mostly all palletized products with a singular barcode they needed to, to shoot, uh, they would actually pull the, the shelf item off, drop it down, scan it right there um, at driver height, 
and then move on with it. Um, now, in other cases, if we were looking at a facility that had the emitter mounted on the forks itself, then we do need to adjust that angle potentially a little bit to make sure that we are able to accommodate the entire rack uh, height. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, and kind of uh, along your line, so I was sitting there and I took a step back and I said, okay, well, so if we do overhead omnidirectional coverage, we have the problem that all the APs hear themselves and we really don't want that to happen. So we moved into our next deployment style, which was, okay, well, let's cover it from the end of the aisle, right? Because, hey, that's got to be better. We're going to have line of sight. We're going to be, you know, able to, to use our environment around us to attenuate the signal. Um, what's the next best way we can cover it? So I came up with this idea of mounting, as you kind of talked about, an AP in the middle of the aisle. Um, however, unlike an omnidirectional antenna, so this is a highly unique specialized antenna uh, that a company many of you may have heard of called Exceltex, uh, based out of San Antonio, Texas, has come up with. So this particular antenna, it's about uh, 13 inches square. Um, it runs uh, a, a unique pattern that's about 120 degrees of vertical beam width and a very narrow 15 degree. Oh, Gustavo's got one already holding it up. It's like a trophy over there. Um, yeah, that's the that's the exact antenna. Um, so Say it's got a. Gustavo, so we can see the antenna. We're not seeing. It. Say something. You got to Yeah, you're muted, Gustavo. There you go. All right. So this is the antenna that he's talking about. It's the same exact right. antenna. Okay, cool. So here's the Exotex model. So if you can see yep. it. And if you, uh, if you copied down my blog earlier, you can go to my blog site. There's a whole post I wrote up on wireless coverage um, talking about try a different antenna. It has the model number, I believe, in that, uh, in that picture. If not, just uh, hit me up on Twitter, and I'll be glad to pass along the info to you. Um, but it has a very unique antenna coverage pattern, as you can see in the image on the right. So this was taken with Echo site survey. So what we did was we, Gustavo, we're going to have to mute you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. Um, so this was taken uh, in a warehouse I was testing with uh, over in Dallas, Texas. Um, same type characteristics, about 27 feet to 32 feet uh, of merchandise on our racks. Uh, antenna was located about 34 feet off of the ground, um, and we pointed it perpendicular to the ground. So the antenna was mounted here, and we were pointing it literally straight down at the middle of the aisle. Uh, and then we did a survey. We walked up and down every single aisle uh, gathering measurements for our survey, and this is what we came up with. So in this particular image, again, gray is anything at neg 70 or below. Uh, anything in color is above that. Um, you can see very easily here in this picture, and th this is probably one of my uh, uh, proudest moments as a wireless engineer, right? You, you did something in a test that actually looked like you wanted it to when you finished. Um, but we have very good signal coverage north to south through the entire aisle. This particular aisle is about 330 feet uh, in its length. Um, the AP and antenna is mounted literally midway of the aisle. Um, and we have negative 65, negative 70 signal all the way down to the far points of the aisle. Uh, you can tell on the, the top of that image, if you will, toward the top of your screen, uh, that we did start to see a little bit of drop off there. Um, this testing was kind of done in a little bit of a, a time crunch, so we didn't have a lot of time to make sure that everything was perfectly aimed and all um, true perpendicular, true middle of the aisle, things of that nature. But it gives us a good representation of what that signal is going to behave like in, in that particular space. Um, now, fortunately, as we talked about knowing your inventory and knowing your customers earlier, you also need to know if there's any kind of cycle that this particular customer that you're working with goes through. Um, some particular places have... Um, cycles where they have low inventory at some points and higher at others. So you really need to, to kind of concentrate on that. Uh, so the cons of this particular design, obviously it requires more APs. The pros are that we have probably the best SNR, best signal noise we're going to get. We maximize the attenuation between aisles and we also lower the chance of obstruction because if you have a forklift moving down the aisle at 33 feet, they're going to be scraping the ceiling before they take out our gear. Um, so as we move to our next slide, so what you'll see here is that same warehouse environment that we built, built the predictive of earlier from an omnidirectional perspective. This is the same particular warehouse now with that antenna pattern down each aisle. Um, like I said, there's no problems putting these down the center of each aisle because we have such good attenuation and such a fine pattern between aisles. Um, and if you'll notice, there is a little bit of gray area here that shows poor signal, but if we actually zoomed in on that, that's actually going to be attenuation inside the rack itself, which we're not concerned about. 
Uh, so we'll kind of move on, uh, kind of to, to finish our coverage discussion is, uh, as I kind of mentioned earlier, knowing your customer, we also need to know what's the workflow. Are, are these stationary things? Are the forklifts going and pulling items back to a central point for scanning? Or are we having those forklifts themselves scan the items as they pull them from the shelves? Um, so just things to be aware of. So as we move to our next slide, and we'll kind of pick up the pace just a little bit here. I promise you we're almost through. Uh, it takes a little while to get through the the meat of the stuff, and then we'll kind of give you the tips at the end. Uh, so as we move to our next slide, we look at uh, our concern number two. We, our concern is the devices themselves. So if you see the image on the left, that is a, a handheld mobile scanner. Uh, it's, a, it's by a company called Intermec. I believe Honeywell actually acquired Intermec a, a not too long ago. Um, these devices are uh, probably the one thing that frustrated me the most in the warehouse environment that I worked with. And each, unite, each device is unique, but you need to really look at your device, look up the information on the device, find out all the information you can, uh, because in this particular device's case, we talk about the devices, and one of our concerns with the devices themselves are the transmit power. Now, a lot of people are thinking, well, do I really need to worry about the transmit power? I should always design my network to the lowest, you know, the least capable, most important device, which obviously in a warehouse is going to be your scanners for your pickers, your barcode information, things like that. This particular device has a very unique case. It works in 5 gigahertz, but the issue with this particular device is that in Uni 1, it has a transmit power of 18 milliwatt, or uh, at 18 dBm. In DFS space, if you're able to use DFS in your environment, this sucker can only broadcast at 25 milliwatts or 14 dBm, right? That's a huge discrepancy, right, in what our cover, what our transmit power of that device is. So that literally changed the entire design, right? We thought we could do it with omnidirectional coverage. We saw we had poor coverage into some of the aisles, but we could overcome that by adding more omnidirectional APs. The problem is, is as we add more APs, we need more channels to choose from. So even if we were able to use DFS in your space, having to design a network where on one band within 5 gig it talks at one power and another set of channels it talks at a different power, it, it, it's, it's absurd. It's very, very difficult to make that work. Um, fortunately, in this case, we were able to get away um, where the, in the facility by simply disabling DFS. Um, and then we kind of tweaked a little uh, coverage here and there with some additional access points uh, that we had. Uh, if we notice, um, if we can jump back just two slides real quick. So one of the things that we actually do, or that I actually like to do sometimes as well is, uh, yep, backwards, two slides, or actually, yeah, keep going back to the, that right there. Okay, so you'll see uh, we've got the APs down the center of each aisle, but you may not have noticed around the perimeter of the building, we have some selectively placed uh, access points as well. These access points are actually using omnidirectional down tilt integrated antennas to give us the coverage in the large open areas. The benefit of that is is that where we saw the signal dropping off just a little bit at the ends of the aisles, this helps backfill that gap and bridge from one area into the next. So we can jump back uh, forward two slides, please, to our devices slide. So we need to know what channels are allowed to be broadcast on, what the transmit power of those devices is, and are the devices fixed or mobile? In this case with the handheld on the left, it's highly mobile. The device moves around easily. It has one set of transmit power. In the case on the right, that's a built-in unit to a forklift uh, that's mounted uh, permanently into the forklift. So while it is mobile, you know, it, we almost have to treat that as a fixed environment because the device itself doesn't move. Uh, in this particular instance, uh, that case around that screen you see where the actual Wi-Fi antenna is, is actually a metal case which creates a lot of issues with wireless. Um, you can overcome that. Uh, in this particular instance, we overcame that by using uh, an external bridge that we mounted on top of the forklift cage itself uh, and then ran an Ethernet cable from it into the device. Uh, to overcome the problem. So we were still using wireless from the, uh, you know, from the environment's perspective, but from the device's perspective, it thought that it was a, just a simply wired connection. Uh, moving on to our next slide. So we'll talk about our final concern, and that's performance. Um, you know, it's probably the big one that everybody is wondering about. Well, how does this all perform? You know, these tests that you see, uh, the numbers 800, 90, 740, those aren't actual numbers. That's just a, just a graphic. So don't think I'm pushing nearly a gig uh, of throughput to a, to a device in a warehouse. Uh, but some of our concerns with performance are A, around roaming, right? How does the device roam in the environment? Are there things we can do like certain channels, avoiding certain channels, making sure that our signal levels, our secondary coverage is high enough so that the device roams more easily? Uh, uh, just handheld devices of this nature for barcode scanning are traditionally very poor roamers. 
Uh, they just they have a lot of issues in a warehouse typically because they just simply see so many BSSIDs in the air. And that's one of the things from the design perspective that we need to account for. Uh, from a voice perspective, right, is the customer doing voice? Many warehouses aren't. Some are. Some are starting to move in that direction. Uh, voice requires a completely different coverage plan than what we would for data. So while I can get away with designing a, a warehouse to NEG70 RSSI from the device's perspective because we're only transmitting barcode information, right? What is barcode information, right? It's, it's a small digit, tw you know, 12 to 14 numbers at best, right? So we're talking about, you know, bits of information, not megabytes or gigabytes or anything like that that we need to transmit. But we're just trying to shoot those barcodes back to a central server as quickly as we can. Uh, so throughput is a concern. However, throughput is not a big concern for most customers in the warehouse type space. We simply, you know, most customers, I would honestly say I could deploy their network right now uh, with just some 802.11b uh, access points and that one to two, uh, two meg data rate would be plenty sufficient for most of the environments that we're going to do. But these days we just can't do that, right? Because if we're going to build a network today, we want to build a network for the future. We want to build something that's going to last the customer, you know, three years, five years, seven years out. So as we move to our next slide, we've talked about all these different things, right, that we need to, to focus on, we need to be aware of um, when we're doing warehouse space. So we'll wait for it. I can jump to our next slide. Oh my gosh, what do I do? I, I've got all this information now, all these things that I need to think about. You know, I thought wireless was easy, right? We, we put up an access point and it just works. Well, we see today clearly that that is not the case. And while many of you maybe knew that already, um, or some of you that may have not done warehouse environment type space before had thought, well, that's pretty easy. It's a big open space. There's not much I can do wrong. Boy, were you in for a treat. I am glad you were here today with us at the conference. So we'll kind of move on now. Uh, if you'll jump to our next slide, we'll look at our kind of five survival tips real quick of doing warehouse wireless. So number one, um, you can see there I even gave you a little bit more Portuguese at the top. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would try to pronounce it, but I, I would all make you laugh, so maybe on the last one. Uh, number one, we want to evaluate the warehouse space over time. So what do I mean by that? You know, is this customer seasonal merchandise? Do they only have a full warehouse from, say, July to Christmas time and then from December on until the next July? We're relatively empty. Um, right, those those changes in the environment greatly affect how we need to cover our space. Um, I always tell people that in some cases I'm probably going to recommend a much higher number of access points um, that you would think. Um, it might even scare you a bit because depending on the customer, you may have the need to design one network that's going to function for six months of the year. Then you may have the need to go in and turn off access points and reconfigure other access points to provide service that you need for the other six months of the year. Because if our warehouse is sitting mostly empty, those shelves don't have a lot of inventory in them or merchandise in them to attenuate that signal, we're going to start adding problems on, right? So problems that didn't exist on day one during busy season may now suddenly in day 20 of non-busy season be a major issue. But that facility still has to function 24-7. So we need to make sure that we evaluate the space over time and that we can kind of counteract how that environment changes. Uh, as we move to our next tip, our, our kind of survival tip number two, choose your APs and antenna wisely, right? So uh, we already had a question in the audience. You asked about covering, you know, putting an omnidirectional uh, antenna down the middle of the aisle. You kind of were on the right path there as, as we were going down. Um, we want to make sure that we choose wisely. We don't want to put a bunch of access points that are all going to be able to hear each other if they're all omnidirectional at the top of our environment space and then not have something that's going to get signal down to where the users are, right? Because what good is a wireless system if the signal works perfectly at 33 feet, but where the people are at one to two meters off the ground doesn't perform, right? It's pretty useless, right? Uh, your customer would be very disappointed if you had put in, or you, if you're the customer yourself, would be very disappointed if your, your VAR put in a solution that you spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on potentially and it didn't perform at the end of the day. So choose your AP and your antenna wisely. Always test if you can the, the combination that you want to use in your warehouse space before you actually go and sell the project or buy the project uh, from the customer's perspective. So number three, our, our survival tip number three is maximize signal attenuation. Now, if you're a true, if you're a wireless person, you've been doing wireless for a while, you're probably looking at yourself right now going, what in the world is he saying? Why would I want to attenuate my signal as much as I possibly could? Well, we already talked about it, right? Did you fall asleep on me during the presentation? 
Everybody's still awake, right? We want to make sure that we're not getting signal in areas that we don't want it to be. We want to maximize the attenuation of that signal between our aisles so that we keep the signal nice and cozy down the middle where we want it, and everybody out here is completely deaf to it, right? Um, and for those of you that are Cisco or if your uh, vendor of choice has a solution such as uh, Receive Sensitivity or RxSOP, um, I would strongly, strongly caution against, util uh, against using that in a warehouse space. Um, we find that uh, RxSOP does a very good job of making the AP deaf. However, that does not make the signal deaf. So this, just because the AP can't hear that device now below a certain threshold doesn't mean that neighboring AP can't hear it as well, right? Because energy is energy. It's still in the air. If I transmit, you're going to hear it even if you're ignoring me, right? Um, I'm sure many of you may have tuned out to me already. Hopefully, I've kept you engaged throughout the conference, but that's essentially what RxSOP is, right? You decided, well, he's not important enough to listen to, so I'm going to kind of focus on something else over here. So our survival tip number four is we move on to the next one, build accurate predictive models. I cannot stress enough to you how important building an accurate predictive model is. Right, the number one thing that I find that people do incorrectly when they work on a project is they don't have enough information put into the predictive model to help them build it accurately. So while it looks great on paper, it looks very poor to the end user device. And finally, I know you've all been waiting for it, right? Survival tip, drum roll. Survival tip number five, test, test, test. Test your design, test your predictive, test your AP and antenna combination, test everything, and guess what? When you get tired of testing, go test more, right? <laughs> test throughout the year. A lot of people, you know, there used to be a, a food rotisserie that, that used to sell in infomercials on TV, and it was the, the Ronco rotisserie, and it was his catchphrase was always, set it and forget it. If you think wireless is a technology that even in 2018 you can set and forget, you are in the wrong field. If you get nothing else from me today, you cannot just set it and forget it, right? We always need constant care and feeding of our networks, even to the point where when we get tired of it, we have to go back and do more. So we'll end on one quick quote. Uh, this was actually, uh, I saw it on Twitter yesterday, from uh, uh, the 5G summit that's actually happening around the United States. Uh, it says, today in a factory, we have a lot of fixed things. They, they, meaning the factory, wants to get rid of fixed Ethernet connections and make everything wireless. That link has to be extremely reliable and low latency. 5G, not 5 gigahertz, but 5G cellular, would enable more reconfigurable, flexible factories of the future. Gustavo will get a kick out of this. He's probably already heard me say, you know, network of the future one time in the shows. The topic of my talk last week at a Wi-Fi trick for CWNP. Um, but I hate to tell them, but whoever stated this quote for, has to be someone that loves the cellular industry because, guys, we've been doing this in wireless, in factories and warehouses for a number of years now. And we have plenty of reliability. We have plenty of low latency. And I just don't know what they're thinking of. So I hope as we move to our next slide that I've kind of walked you through kind of how to approach a warehouse facility, gave you some pointers to look for, gave you some ideas and things that maybe you hadn't thought of before. Um, hopefully you gain something from it. At this time, we'll kind of cut loose, probably close to time anyway. Any quick questions? Yeah, I think we do have, yeah. It's possible to use the RAM gauge cable in this solution. Uh, yeah, I think the question is leaky coax. What do you think about leaky coax? Don't use it. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I've worked with some leaky coax in the past. Um, leaky coax, is it's it's just too unpredictable. Um, it, it's fairly old tech. I know some places still have it. Um, I've actually worked in some hospitals that still utilized it um, up until a couple years ago when we were doing some refreshes for those. Um, at the end of the day, the performance and all of it just is not something that you want to deal with. Um, it, it saves on number of access points, but you know, the whole thing that we're trying to do here is get higher SNR throughout the space and more predictable, um, more reliable signals um, where we need them to be. Um, you know, Verizon, one of the carriers here in the States used to say more bars in more places, and that's what we're looking for in wireless as well. Great. Other questions for uh, the directional antenna that you showed before in your predictive site survey, uh, how many degrees uh, it has? 
So in the uh, in the predictive site survey, it actually uh, that antenna pattern is built into the ECAL software already. Uh, so it's a 15 degree horizontal by 120 degree vertical beam width. And, and remember, you know, I, I probably don't have to tell you guys this, but I, I always reiterate it because a lot of people don't do a lot of work with external antennas. Um, 120 degrees is not, you know, this, right? 120 degrees is each direction, right? So we're really getting about 240. So if you will, I'm only eliminating about 60 degrees behind me on the back lobe, if you will, of what that antenna can cover. That's how we were able to get such a large swath down that aisle, as you saw. All right. All right, last slide. We've all been waiting for it. Yeah, that was that. Uh, Obrigado. <laughs> there you go. You got my one question.